Hi, everyone. sort of continued the relationship we had with um, uh, this boy's life. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was good finally to be able to work together, uh, uh, Marty, you know, myself, um, after all these years. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Leo, how about, how about you? What was it like to work with this trifecta? It frankly meant uh, a great deal to me. <clears throat> you know, my career started, and I'll, I'll say it um, as many times as I can, with this man to my left here believing in me and helped and help cast me and chose me for my f first starring role in feature films in this boy's life. We got to do it uh, in the, another film together, but I don't believe we had any scenes together in Marvin's room. Yeah. But it was literally 30 years later that, you know, after Bob mentioning to Marty, uh, you should check this kid out. When I was 16 years old, I got to do so many incredible films with Marty now, and they've, in a lot of ways, both been mentors and you know, cinematic father figures to me, and to have this great concentric circle, you know, 30 years later with both of them <clears throat> meant a lot. And, you know, one of the moments, and I've said this before, that I, I really remember was us working on the final sequence to uh, our relationship, to Ernest's relationship with Hale. And we spent many, many weekends, weekend after weekend after weekend, and it was so f amazing to watch both of their process and all of us together just we kept talking it out because I think the original script had this really sort of electrifying attack from Ernest and we kept on saying wait no there is 
kind of a, a love there. There is a he is a father figure to him, and this is this moment of reckoning between them, and to just watch both of them distill that scene more and more and more down to the truth of what these two people would be, which was a one of the most memorable sort of collaborations that I think the three of us had, and, and uh, I'm very proud of that scene. So yeah, that was the uh, the jail sequence at the end. The two of them confront confront him. Yeah. Um, that was a part of something that came out of, of you know Bob and I since 1972 whatever we're together and even earlier of course but um, uh, so the odd thing for me is that you introduced me to Leo and then something happened there was this flurry of like 20 years and it was all these movies and people and it's almost as if we had already all three of us had been acting together in a way, so when it all slipped into this business of whether it was Irishman first or Kills of the Flower Moon first, somehow it all seemed to fit very natural that um, the three of us just suddenly looked around and realized, oh, the three of us are together. <laughs> really? And it's always been that way because of um, events and things that we've been hanging around and, and, um, and that sort of thing. And also the flurry of the years is odd because at our age now, for Bob and I at least, uh, it, uh, <laughs> It, it seems um, like uh, some sort of a, a train ride or something that just keeps going and suddenly you look back and 25, 30 years have gone by, you know, and uh, there's been a constant, and that's Bob and, and Leo also for me. So for, for us to be on the set together, uh, it was very natural, you know, very natural. And, and Lily, um, you received this arousing applause because you were just sensational in this film. <laughs> what was it like for you to work alongside these titans of film? What was that, what was that like for you? Who, who have had this long-standing relationship with one another for so many years. I mean, <laughs> it's, I, I, I mean, I just had the best seat in the house for this collaboration, honestly. Um, when I stopped pinching myself, which I still am, it's, um, it's such a gift as the new kid in this dynamic to walk into something that's so established and is so, you know, established between these three and these two particularly, which has kind of established cinema for my generation, <laughs> um, I think for a lot of us in here. So I kind of found that it was something I couldn't think about too much. Um, there were a couple of moments where, I don't know, when we started working together and finding our dynamic where you would kind of tease me about the reality of my situation <laughs> amongst you three. And I'd be like, shut up, shut up. I can't think about that. more uncomfortable. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was end of, end of week one. I mean, first scene with both of them, my hands were just completely shaking. And I thought it was good. And then I got in front of Bob and I was just not good. <laughs> but then it was, then it was fine. Um, at, at a certain point, you just, kind of sober up and realize that you're all here to tell a story you all tremendously care about and to be too, um, too meek about it or too humble about it or too intimidated by it, I guess, is doing a disservice to these titans who are all just incredible human beings and so committed to a story that generations of film have been marginalizing, putting out of focus, putting in the sidelines and you know, they all, they all were so open. And it wasn't just like, you know, having a seat at the table for me. It was like, what are you bringing to dinner? You know, so it was, I didn't have a lot of time. <laughs> I mean, I had three months before I ever got there to try and not be in my head too much about it. But. Well, it's certainly a testament to your acting abilities because your performance was just absolutely effortless. Absolutely effortless. Um, Martin, you are one of the most storied directors in Hollywood, and you have taken us to explore the depths of so many aspects of American culture. Why did you have to tell 
the story of the Osage and the Osage murders right now? Why were you so compelled to tell this story? Well, I think part, uh, a great part of it has been uh, the, the grace of time that I've had over the years. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know if I knew this was exactly the right time to tell it. It just seemed to all come together this way at this time. But it did start with me back um, in a project I was involved with for a few months uh, back in 74. Uh, uh, I, I found myself on the Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, Lakota Sioux. And um, uh, I was only 30 years old. I didn't quite. Um, you know, I made mean streets, and I had not. I was still making. Alice doesn't live here anymore, actually, while I was there. And so, um, I was uh, my naivete, ignorance of um, what I encountered that was such so traumatic to me. Um, I, I can't categorize what what it was. I can't say, oh, this is what was happening to these people. I there's no category for it. And so it just awakened me in, in, a, in a way. Um, and I was never a person uh, to uh, suddenly make uh, films that were, um, uh, you know, uh, headlines of the, of the time that could be, that could be uh, of a time and place really important and then forgotten about two years later. I just never made that kind of film. So I, I didn't know how, I, I just sensed that somehow I need to get myself involved in a situation where I could express what I felt when I was there at Pine Ridge, and uh, for the indigenous, and, uh, and, and for ourselves, too, uh, the white European. And so uh, it took many years, and I became involved with a number of people, one of them being Robbie Robertson, who's of uh, the First Nations, uh, half Mohawk, uh, and beginning to understand more and more about indigenous and the music, too. The music, so much of rock and roll comes from Native American. Link Ray, Rumble, all these, you know, all this incredible stuff. They made that film, Rumble, you know, about rock and roll uh, coming from uh, Native American. But in any event, um, ultimately, uh, by the time I received that, I think through you, Leo, the, the book, David Grant's book, Killers of the Plow Moon, my first reaction was, this has got to be right. Now, I don't know if I'm going to get it right, but what I'm saying is that we've got to be very careful that when we deal with the indigenous here, that, you know, we're doing it not just for authenticity. Authenticity is going to be hard enough, but um, there's got to be a truth we have to find here. And I, I, you know, and it, I kept thinking about it, giving it up, thinking about it, giving it up. We're making Irishmen. And um, that, in a way, um, made me see things differently. Uh, and by that point in time, there was a long period of uh, gestation because of Irishmen, uh, which took uh, a year and three quarters to make, and then COVID. And it was that for solitude, in which we're trying to come to terms with the script. Eric Roth, myself, a number of friends of mine were all, you know, in there and, uh, through uh, Zooms and telephone calls and things like that. And um, bottom line is that what I found, um, what I found uh, uh, as the core of the story was that night in Osage country, where right before COVID hit, I had the ability, I had the the, the uh, um, the chance to uh, visit twice uh, Oklahoma. And second visit, there was a dinner at Great Horse, 250 of the Osage. And that night is when I understood that we have to go deeper because that night I saw the face. I saw the face of the Osage. They had faces, they had voices. And I was wondering, you know, saying to myself, who are they? I could figure out the FBI guys. I could figure out who are they? And that night I found out. And then I realized, uh oh, <laughs> we have a story here that's about love and betrayal, trust and betrayal, but truly a love story. And how do we do that? And it took another year and a half, I think, before we started shooting. We had that COVID period to work it out. So um, those are the elements that came together. Yeah, I mean, I know those faces. Um, they're faces of people who, even after a century, are still reeling from these murders. And you mentioned um, having to get it right. Tell me about all of you, the responsibility that you carried to ensure that you told this story right. And, and how often do you, do you reflect on those faces 
who again are still living in, with the grief today. And thank you so much for your special on CNN, Lisa. That was that meant so much to so many people. If you haven't watched it, she did a she did a special about the reign of terror, and um, spoke to a lot of the people who were very seminal in shaping how we went about things. Um, so, I don't know. Should I just about that that broad responsibility that you carried, and and how different was that um, from things that you had experienced on other films? I mean, I guess I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, not being Osage, but being native, being Blackfeet and Espers, um, every tribal nation in this country has some history with exploitation of resource. Um, and, you know, history being a modern thing, you know, it's shaped, you know, the study of history is understanding our present, and it's shaped who we are. And, everything that we do and I was so grateful to learn when I was auditioning that they were doing a locals casting first and that there were so many Osages playing these historical members of their own nation. Um, it was, uh, I knew that walking in, having grown up in a place that was of high interest for a lot of films, my reservation is very close to Glacier National Park, so we get movies once in a great while, and sometimes sets come in and they're great, you know? It's, um, they're always, the community always remembers the stories of the film being there and the people working on it. Um, sometimes it's not always the best film or not always the most respectful to community, so like, I knew going in I would have to conduct myself, because I'm not Osage as an outsider, but as a native person who understands that, um, the way I was raised, you know, to listen, to, not speak first to bring gifts because people are giving you their stories and their time so you thank them for that um and to really just try to handle it the way i would expect somebody who was playing a blackfeet character on my reservation talking about the baker's massacre um to to conduct themselves and really what was so lovely because I, I had nerves as a native actor walking into this level of a project. Hollywood doesn't have the greatest history. I mean, I knew my introduction to Marty as a filmmaker was Kundun, so I knew that he knew how to get inside and do it in a very humane, beautiful, challenging way. Um, so I had faith that it would work out, but there was some terror there. <laughs> um, but it just, every step of the way, I, I mean, production was out there so long in advance and developing relationships with community. So when, by the time the actors got there, Leo and I had meetings set up with people and we just went to listen and every little bit, it wasn't just the preliminary pre-production too, it was throughout. It was if something wasn't right or if Marty heard a story that fit thematically and historically and just was a very human element, those pages got scrapped, they got replaced. Um, Yancey, Yancey Redcorn, his audition, I believe, he went off book and improvised and exactly, yeah, and his, imp his improvisation is what you see in the film. You know, I fought at the box of rebellion and I could see my enemy. And it's like, if I knew who my enemy was, I would kill him. That was all Yancey's improv from his audition. Um, Everett Waller, when he's speaking about um, Osages, when they die by the enemy, don't let them die alone. Um, you know, rousing as, as Assistant Chief Paul Red Eagle, who Everett Waller's very familiar with. I mean, Everett had started that just to get reaction shots from everybody in the roundhouse, um, and then Marty's like, no, <laughs> put the camera on him and just let him keep going. And it's kind of funny, because I mean, Everett's just known for being like that in the community, <laughs> so everybody's like, yeah, it makes sense. Everett's just being Everett. But everything that he said was in the moment, improv because he he knows this history he teaches it to the younger generation so it was really refreshing as a native actor to get to just be an actor a lot of times when you're on and that's how it was so different for me a lot of times when you're native you're not playing your own nation there's 574 federally recognized tribes and several other hundred that are not um, you oftentimes are one of the only voices, if not the only one, and then you're playing researcher, you're playing 
you're, you're helping with props, you're like explaining that no, I don't speak this language, I barely speak my own language, I need, it's like I'm not gonna just come in and know how to say these things. It's, um, it's been a very, it's been a varied experience being a native actor, but in this case, I got to just be an actor because Osage were carrying this and I listened. I committed so much to learning the language. We all did. I mean, everybody talks about how Bob speaks incredible Osage. This is perfect. Well, I, I, I want to talk about that because there is this effort underway to teach kids the Osage language because it's a language that is in danger of going, going extinct, yet there's so much of the Osage language spoken in this film. How did that come about? And Bob, what did it feel like to speak Osage? What did it feel like for all of you to speak Osage? Well, it was, I, I had no idea how the language would sound or anything. I just knew it would be, whatever it would be, it would be not <clears throat> something I totally alien to me. And so I, I started learning it with this young man, Chris, uh, who's terrific. Um, and I just uh, practiced a lot because I did not want to, I wanted to, I wanted it to be so second nature. Um, and all it was was just a lot of practice. Really, it was really that simple. Chris just adores you. Huh? Chris adores you. Huh? Your, your language teacher, teacher Chris, he adores you. He really appreciates you. Oh, he's so, he was great. He was it's probably great. pretty exciting for him to say that. Todd Bob De Niro had a CEO stage. Oh, yeah. He reminds you constantly. <laughs> <laughs> We're still friends. The thing is, we, we had um, discovered that Ernest uh, Burkhart, the real Ernest uh, that Leo's character is based upon, did speak Osage. I said, so, you know, he had a fascination with the Osage. He was upset. So remember we talked about doing this and you yeah. can learn it. Whole scenes in Osage. Mm -hmm. well, well. <laughs> Chris also. How did, it, how did it feel, Leo, to speak of Osage? It was interesting um, because a lot of, you know, the connection that Molly and Ernest have is that he starts to learn about the culture, you know. But it was always tricky with, with, with my character because from the onset of doing this film, you know, here we were, you know, a century later telling this story, century later, later after the, the Tulsa massacre, a century later after one of the first murders, and we started to immerse ourselves in, 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 in Oklahoma, started to listen to the Osage community. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of mixed views about Ernest and Ernest, you know, was obviously a bit of a chameleon, but one of the things he did do was start to learn almost like a historian himself about the history of the Osage nation and started to learn the language. Now, was this a manipulation tactic? Was it not? These are things that we, as we were filming, we were trying to piece together because at one time this was somewhat of a FBI murder mystery and we had to sort of decompress all that and bring it back down towards an organic love story but I think can, it's... Can you elaborate a little bit more on that Leo because uh, the, the film that you all saw is very different from the original version of it. I mean the original version was more of like a kind of a, a, a crime drama right that centered on yes, yes. law and, enforcement yeah, and, and the evolution of the FBI. Yeah, because and, that, and that night in Grey Horse, when they talked about, when Margie Burkhart got up and talked about, remember that Ernest and Molly were in love, and it suddenly hit me, and uh, I realized I think we may be coming, we're, we're coming at the story maybe in the wrong way. I don't know how to go yet. I didn't know. And then COVID hit, and, and you came to me right before COVID hit, and you said, I think, you know, where's the heart of the story? I said, the heart seems to be with Molly and Ernest. I said, well, why don't I, why don't I play Ernest? She said, I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, because we tried everything else, and it's good and everything, but we've seen it before. I mean, as a film, I'm talking about. And also, it seems to be from the outside in. But here was the inside. But now we gotta get inside. Now, how do we do that? Okay, so we start working on the script and COVID hit. And all through that COVID period is where it all changed and developed in terms of Ernest and Molly, in terms of uh, Bob's character, uh, um, 
came to the Osage Hills, that kind of sustained all the way through until the jail scene, I think, you know, he kept working on that. Well, even in the, uh, also the paddling scene too, that we kept working on. But, but um, his, at least he knew Bob, Bob had a character was going, but here we had to sort of start from, we had to go right to the heart of things and that actually didn't finish until the day we finished shooting. I mean, what, what a, an astounding, confounding character. Uh, Ernest Burkhart was. And, you know, there's fierce debate about whether he really did love Molly. I mean, based on the research that you did and the interactions that you had with their descendants, do you believe that he really loved Molly? I listened to what the Osage community told me. And a multitude of them came up to me and said, remember this, that was a real marriage. He really loved her. It's shocking because you read the book, how could you know somebody that is so, so filled with deception and could do this to his own family really love this person? And it brought us on this journey to creating an unreliable protagonist wherein <clears throat> We didn't even know how complicit he was while we were filming, you know, how much information he knew, what he was withholding from her. We, we, we kept, you know, developing this relationship as it went on and it became more and more powerful. And I think the connection between the both of us became more and more powerful. I, you know, like I said, I got to speak to direct descendants of, of my character you know, the niece of, of Ernest Burkhart, who was, you know, a 13-year-old inquisitive young girl who wanted to ask her her, uh, her uncle about the murders and waited till Christmas time when he was drunk and got him to admit certain things to her. I mean, this story is so uh, sensitive, it is so fresh, and it still affects generations of people in that place. And it's, it's amazing to have gone to a location where it's such a raw nerve still, and you can talk to people that are still on those lands that are the direct relatives that are still affected by, by what and happened. After he was pardoned, he was sentenced to life, and then he was pardoned, and went back to live mm -hmm. yeah. among the Osage. Yeah. I mean, it is... Yeah, people remember him showing up. Like, he passed away in 1986, same year I was born. Um, so there's people that we talked to who remembered him, and they said he'd come to community doings and sit in the back. Like he very quiet, didn't interact with people really, but he kept showing up and just would be there. I think he really found a home. And um, you know, Margie, who we talked to, her father was cowboy, the the son, and she told us that cowboy, who was known in the community as being very fun loving, larger than life. Um, so was Lizzie, they loved throwing parties. We found that as evidence that they had a happy childhood, so their family must have been very fun-loving, because that was kind of our job, you know, what was it like behind closed doors? Um, and Cowboy maintained a relationship with his dad. He'd be with people at a party, hanging out with everybody, and he would kind of get somber and like, just ironically say, like, oh, excuse me, I gotta go pick up dynamite. That was the nickname he gave his dad. <laughs> well, um, at some point, I think they drifted apart, but it took a long time. It's, you know, after, there was, it's, it's still baffling, but there was love in this family, you know? One of the things that was wild to me when I was there was so many of the Osage didn't even become aware of these murders until David Grant's book came out. Oh, and there were only these prosecutions. There were hundreds of Osage That's right. That's right. Uh, who were murdered during right. the Reign of Terror. Um, yeah. But yet we only know of these two. Um, Mark, tell us about how closely you worked with the Osage community. And for all of you, were there things, were there scenes that may have changed because members of the Osage Oh, yes, um, yeah. had issues or, or well, not issues constantly. Yeah, like what Wilson Pipestem yeah. was uh, 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 kind of uh, being very forceful with me when I first met him. He said, you don't understand certain things. You don't understand that, that um, 
Phil Hale, we all, you know, everybody liked Phil Hale. He said, Phil Hale and, and Herbie Rome, they were best friends. And I looked around. Between that and hearing Margie Burkhart say that they were in love, I said, oh, yeah. it was all around the same time, by the way, in one of those visits. And then at one point he told me later on, he said, uh, you don't understand the Osage way. He said, uh, you know, my grandmother, um, when I was a little kid, uh, would be running around and there'd be a big thunderstorm coming. And my grandmother would say, stop you running around, sit down. And I'd say, why, Grandma? And he said, come here, because Wakanta sent the storm, and the storm has power, and we have, it's a gift from Wakanta. Sit and appreciate the gift from Wakanta. And I said, that, and I said, oh, okay. And he said, that's the kind of thing, and I just went away and I wrote it down. And put it in the film at the end of the first dinner scene. And she wrenches him out of his world and makes him stop and, and become part of, of, of the Osage way of thinking, and he goes with it, you know, he goes with it. So that's just one instance of somebody just, somebody, Wilson was a, he's a, he's a lawyer too, isn't he? I mean, uh, coming by and saying something, and say, okay, let's go there, let's go, that's interesting, let's go there. Um, um, the whole idea too of the, um, um, hmm, the ancestors coming to take you home, is something special too that I've worked on for quite a while, the owl, all of that, we had even more of that stuff and then we pulled it out of the script. But um, in any event, uh, it, the, the way of working was that, um, oh, uh, Chris, I think, told you the story of um, the, uh, the coyote and the whirlwind. Mm -hmm. And that became their relationship. And maybe you could say a little about that, about the yeah. coyote. I mean, we, um, when he told me this story in our, in our language lessons, um, you know, vetted it, asked everybody if it was an okay thing to share and kind of base, because, you know, community stories, you don't want to put them in a movie for everybody. They belong to the community, but this is one that people share quite a bit. Um, but more or less, when Molly calls Ernest Shomikasi, she's not just hearkening to the animal coyote. The coyote is one of the Osage trickster figures, um, so she's calling him a trickster. And coyote... And there was a whole other trickster figure that was kind of applied that was never surfaced in our film, but was in the subtext for Hale is raccoon. Raccoon is the evil one. <laughs> um, Coyote's the fop. Coyote's the fun-loving one. It's the one that, like, it's the one that felt the closest to Blackfeet, our trickster figure that I was raised. Some of the stories are almost identical, but um, our trickster figure in our language translates to the same word, or the same root word as white man. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, our trickster figure came first and the word for white man came later. But um, there's that duplicity, that nature of friend and foe. Um, but our trickster figure is very self-serving, very hedonistic. Um, and never ultimately really wins, like screws up things for everybody else along the way, but isn't really the victor in the story. So that clicked for me. It's like, that's the blind spot that Ernest can hide in for Molly. If she, if she from the jump, labels him as a trickster and has his number, knows what he's about, but feels like she's got it handled because she was raised with these stories. She was raised knowing this type, which is highly entertaining. And I mean, it's a dynamic that is, exists in my family, this um, like larger than life, like self, you know, hedonistic cowboy type who just lives to make his self-possessed, like graceful, stoic Indian woman laugh. You know, <laughs> this is, it's that dynamic is a very real one. Um, and it really felt like that story. And suddenly the arc of the story made sense to me in a different way too because, um, and I told Marty, I joked with Marty a couple of times that people have been trying so hard to call this film a Western. <laughs> um, and I, understandably, you know, but to me, it's the genre that makes most sense to me is it's a trickster story. It's a trickster noir. Because at the end of a trickster story, by calling Ernest Shomikasi again at the end, when She's been the one who's burned. Her whole community's been the one who's burned because he just hasn't learned his fucking lesson. Excuse my, excuse my language. Um, but then that made sense to me that Molly was a character in the way that we told it, of this broader trickster narrative. 
and um, she got burned by him, her community got burned by him. So yeah, and that kind of really, it helped us find our dynamic. I know that it helped you with some character choices early on. It helped with some of, honestly, just some of the small things that were in the original script written in English to be translated into Osage that didn't translate. Like there was a line Molly had where she was talking with her sisters. The four of us sat down together and kind of rewrote our lines for that scene so that it would be easier to translate, but also we could bring our personalities into it more. Um, but it was kind of, that re-brainstorming session that the four of us had was based off of changing one line that Chris Cote couldn't translate, which was Molly was saying Ernest had these devil blue eyes. He's like, there's no way to say that in Osage. But then at that point it was like, well, coyotes have those big white eyes. Coyotes have that going on and that accomplishes everything that text was saying. We found a way to bring that line back later when we were kind of in the car and in that flirtatious scene, the handsome devil line was a way of reviving that and bringing that concept back. But Well, speaking of the handsome devil, Leo, you still didn't answer whether you believe that Ernest really loved Molly. Based on you know, I saw one piece of footage from him. Um, I, I, I'm gonna answer that, but I do wanna add to what you were saying earlier about what we took from those initial Osage meetings about the story. And I do want to say that David Grand's book was so incredibly detailed. He went in there forensically to really study the history. And, but I, the thing that I think we felt most of all was the role of the Osage in bringing the attention of what was going on to the government. It was there. It was them that were the catalysts, you know. This, I think the, the original book has a lot to do with the onset of the FBI, the forensics of all that, how they solved this case. And in a lot of ways that was used as a propaganda tool in films like the FBI story with Jimmy Stewart to showcase the great efforts of the FBI. But Molly and the Osage were really the heroes in this story. They were the ones that after years and years of the FBI ignoring these murders, even though Native American territory is under their jurisdiction, she was the one that went to Washington. The Osage were the ones that were, you know, pleading and, and, and finally got these, these, um, these murders solved. So I think that that was, that really shifted our story in, in a major way. Now, do I think that he loved her? That's a very complicated question. I, uh, I saw him, I saw video footage of him. We read all the documents, all the court transcriptions. There was one moment of him in his late 90s where his family is asking him about her. And, you know, he basically said she was a good one. She was a good one, which we used in the movie. Um, do I believe that, you know, what is love? Do you think that somebody could you know, simultaneously poison his own wife and be a part of destroying her entire bloodline, and you can call that love? I would argue no. <laughs> um, but do I believe that he did care for this woman and that he did have a, a, a very deep and real relationship? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the thing. It's, it's, uh, you know, the amount of, we could talk about Ernest for a long time, because the element of delusion and thinking that, oh, Uncle Bill will never let it go that far. You know, it'll never affect me or Molly or, I mean, by the time, you know, it'll work itself out. It's not gonna get that crazy. I'm just saying, that's the kind of thing we talked about every day. So what you get here is a glimpse of how we pull the whole story together daily as we're making the film, you see. Well, I, I, I could, I have so many questions I still have to ask, but Marty, you, um, you've made cameos in quite a number of your films. Um, <laughs> Oh my god, I'm in it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say that this appearance carries carries a, a lot more weight because you are um, recounting Molly Burkhardt's obituary. Um, why was this such an important role for you specifically? Well, by that time, when, when I had this idea of the radio show when, with the Eric Roth, we were way from the beginning of first working on the script. and. Um, uh, by the time we shot the movie, 
Um, anyway, the radio show was shot a few, about two months later um, in New York, actually. Um, and by that time, uh, because the radio show was a very thin line, you know, you have to, it's a very tricky thing to pull off in that it can be, it can be uh, farcical, but at the same time, it's based on real radio shows of the period. Um, the FBI story, uh, not the FBI story, but there were gangbusters and things like that that promoted the FBI. The, the scripts do exist. Um, and so we had to ride that thin line there, but primarily by the time the obituary is to be read, I didn't, I didn't know how to direct it. And so I thought, I didn't know who to cast or who, to, who could do it. Um, I didn't really understand anymore. I, I, and I felt that I was so invested in the story. I said, what if I try it? And if, I don't, if it isn't right, at least I have something and I could reshoot it. It's a medium shot, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but the thing was that um, somehow, it's a very kind of strange thing about this particular film, but somehow living the movie for so long, especially living in Oklahoma and being there every day and then being with the Osage and all that, something um, affected me, I guess, and it came out in the, in the sort of recitation, in a way, of this obituary. And there was uh, my wife was there, Helen, and uh, uh, my daughters, uh, my, uh, my daughter Domenica, and uh, my granddaughter there, also in the audience. And, and there I was talking about all the grades that I had seen. and. Um, Suddenly, you know, a lot of I think my own um, I I feel for myself my own culpability in terms of being who I am and the cultures I come from or seem to come from and um, the entertainment over the years that I have admired and still do uh, that I have to bear some of the responsibility and so something happened on stage when we did that and so I left it in. congratulate you on creating such a brilliant and illuminating film that highlights this very essential um, and, and, and vital aspect of American history. So thank you so much.